All right, hey everybody, welcome to the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. Today we're going to talk about pink salmon with Captain Jerry Urbanozo, who had uh, the state record for like a week or two this summer. <laughs> <laughs> that was at least a month or more, come on. <laughs> Three weeks, maybe. Was it? No, yeah, it, was, it was really quick. <laughs> yeah, it was quick. It was really quick because we were in the shop laughing. Like, ah, he got a record and immediately just was trumped up. And, and, and uh, But... Uh, Considering you were the first one uh, in, the, in the state to uh, uh, get a record, and there's a funny story about how, well, that whole thing. We're, we're going to get into that one for sure, but uh, considering you were the first to, to, to get on it and it became a state record for, for a brief period of time, it seems like it seemed like anyway to me that after that happened, um, then it became the hunt for pink salmon. It was a whole thing. Uh, you know, this season for, I don't know, like two months or so. Yep. It was, a, it was like everyone was on the hunt. Every Facebook group for salmon fishing on Lake Michigan. Is this a, was this a pink? What do you guys think? It was everyone was trying to ID them. Everyone was trying to see if they could, you know, up the size and all that. So it was an incredible experience this year because where the hell did the pink salmon come from? That's, let's start there. And, and do you happen to have some insight into that? Yeah. Well, well, originally, you know, there's there's lots of stories, you know, that, that and how they ended up in, uh, first of all, Lake Superior from a train car breaking down and the guy just <laughs> dumping them to a hatchery <laughs> truck on his way to another place and his truck breaking down and just dumping him, them in the river. And, you know, one of the more accurate stories was it was left over from a hatchery and it was they were being transported somewhere else and they had 20,000 leftovers and then they ended up stocking them into the current river which flows into uh, to lake superior and so that's the most accurate information that we have on that it seems like yeah so but you know it, it wasn't an intentional like we're gonna stock pink salmon into lake superior um it was one of those leftovers hey what are we, what are we gonna do with these guys let's see if they make it i guess and they stocked them and you know they they started to spread eventually. And it was around the mid 1950s when they stopped in 1956, supposedly, and then. Okay, so yeah, this is a long time ago. Yeah. So it makes sense that now, at this point where we're, where we're at, that they've could have built up that population that that we saw. It was, I mean, uh, over the over the summer period, guys were catching truly a mixed bag of kings, coho, pinks, you know, and then your other species as well, all the trout and all that stuff. It was it was definitely an exciting period for people, right? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. lots of interest in it. Yeah, yeah. What uh, walk us through this day as you go out? Uh, the day you caught this this pink salmon. Now, mind you, how big do they typically get? I mean, what's their? They're not like monsters. They are a lot smaller here due to their diet in in uh, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. I've gotten them up in Alaska, and they're probably five six pounds or better. Oh, that's respectable. Um, yeah. At least that's why I remember them. You know, I was. Uh, catching them in Ketchikan, but here, they, you know, their their diet's a little bit different, and they typically grow a little bit smaller. I think the record actually previously in Illinois was closer to two nine or not even three pounds, roughly there. So yeah, so this year I I, I just noticed them like mixed in with cohos a lot more, and almost running into you know the spring coho size yeah. one to two pound range yep. was your typical pinks. It it um. It, it seems like, and I think it's very possible that even before you caught your, your, your pink that became a state record that drew eyes to the fact that this was even a species in the water. Many people did not know this. And, and when I speak on this, I'm talking about the general fishing you yep. know, community. You know, now you're going to have like some of you people that are been on the water a long time. Charter captains are probably dialed in more and understand that and everything. But, but the, by and large, the wider fishing community didn't really know this fish existed. And so probably for a lot of years prior to now, people have been catching them and easily confusing them with coho. And there's a really a, a couple of ways to identify them and separate them from coho, which, which are what? Uh, they do have a fork tail like a coho. Their eyes generally are a little bit bigger. You're just looking at it, but it's still hard to distinguish them from a coho. Uh, the very easy telltale are the oval uh, spots on the tail. They're, they're longish. Well, you know, the kings are going to be rounded. These are definitely, you can tell that they're long, oval-shaped spots on the tail. Yeah, I'm, we actually did a, we put a picture on our Instagram. I'm going to try and superimpose it behind us uh, so you guys can kind of see. We, we actually lined up a king of coho and a, and a uh, pink, 
and you can see, you know, the, the, the tails, which is a big kind of big key identifier. Also, by and large, kings are going to be generally be bigger unless you're catching like the shakers, right. you know, which yeah. then you can kind of, it goes on the fence. Um, and it made for interesting uh, Facebook posts because then everyone is like, is this a, is this a uh, pink? And then, you know, people are trolling those people. No, that's a, that's a. Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Every post then, I mean, the messenger just blew up every day. Every morning yeah. I wake up, you know, by 10 o'clock, there's at least two, three fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the day of this catch, walk us through what you were doing, what you had in the water. Um, and, you know, when you got this fish on, on board. So. Basically, it was during Salmonorama, um, getting ready to get out. I think Rob and Phil, I'm not sure if you were probably out there on the box stuffer, and they're like, oh, we got a hot bite here just outside the hill. So I, probably I went there, and I think they were they had four fish in a row before I could even set my lines, and I had clients that day. And I'm like, I'm just watching them catch fish, and finally I'm like, okay, I need to get out of here. I don't have the program. So I turned the boat east, and I got one fish, and they looked at me like, we're still leaving? I'm like, yep, we're still leaving. We're getting out of here. So uh, like, there's a coho bite out deeper, and it's a little bit more predictable. You know, We tried to get a king early in the morning, and it didn't happen for us. We got like a three, four pounder maybe. So we packed up. We ran um, about 13 miles out, and we set up lines, and it was still slow. I saw Captain Bob Rosa there. He kind of tipped me on a coho bite. How deep of water is this now? Uh, we were probably, we started about 200 to 225. Gotcha. And just started trolling, and we started picking up fish. And Alex, the kid who actually reeled in a state record, uh, lost two fish before that. I think one was a good-sized laker, and his dad was starting to give him that look like, come on, can't be losing these fish, you know? <laughs> it wasn't hot and heavy, but it was a steady pick for us. And then the dipsy started shaking. I'm like, okay, that's a small one. I'm like, here you go, Alex, reel this one in, you know? should be a good warm-up fish for you and then you got into the boat and i just briefly looked at it i wanted to get that dipsy back in at a at a, uh, a li blue liz fly in on a um on a stubby and i just wanted to get that thing back in the water and the fish was just flopping on the bottom like that is an odd looking fish you well know? did it really stick out to you did you notice the tail what was it about it that was odd I just threw it right back in. The because tail, anybody else yeah. would just think it's just another coho. I mean, the way Rob flips the, the, his fish in, he would just never <laughs> just have another coho. Right. And <laughs> dumps it in the back. And like, you know. And that's one of those, yeah, you, you look at it briefly. It doesn't really register in your mind, and you, you know, just throw it back in. And, you know, we, we kept fishing, you know, getting more cohos and occasional lake trout. And the second one came, and I'm like, okay, that, that, that looks kind of weird, too. I'm like... I'll take a look at it later. So throw it back in a live well. And, you know, by the end of the day, you're like, okay, ready to go back home. So we got back in and into the harbor. We got, you know, we got their limit, you know, three guys, I think 15 fish. And I said, okay, let's take a good picture, you know, for on the rack. So we started hanging them up. And I looked at both of those pinks. I'm like, okay, these just look like pink salmon. So I walked over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife guys that were, um, doing a survey, and I was like, hey, I think we got two pinks here. What do you think? The first thing they said was, oh, they're too, they're too big to be pinks. They're cohos. I'm like, well, you, in my head, you can't judge a fish size to determine what it is. Mm -hmm. and they didn't even look at the telltale, so I'm like, well, look at the tail. Like, no, it's a coho. Wow. So part of me didn't want, really want to argue with them. But, you know, so they cut the belly open to check for eggs to see what if a male or female species. But I put that one aside. Even though they cut it, I said, okay, let's, let's just put this one aside. Um, fillet the fish, all 14 I filleted. And I told the guys, I'm like, hey, listen, um, Rob at Lake Michigan Anglers got a certified scale. You guys want to come with me? and weigh this fish. And the guy's like, no, you can have it. You can keep it if you want to eat it. I'm like, no, I don't want to eat this fish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think there's a chance that this might be a record fish. And they didn't even, didn't even phase them. They, you know, they packed up and left. I'm like, okay, fine. So I'm like, okay, I think I got two minutes to make it to, to the harbor. So I left and we got here. And I opened the door and I was like, we're close. <laughs> the first thing you told me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, you're not. Turn that scale on. And I just flopped the fish in the scale. I'm like, what do you think this did, Rob? And he goes, that's a pink salmon. 
So, I mean, even Rob knew right away right then. And I figured he would because, you know, he's seen him. Yeah. His dad uh, is one of the best taxidermists I know. And I Shout out to Tom. Him. Yeah. Tom, yeah. We sent him pictures, and he goes, yep, that's a pink. What, 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 uh, so at that point, you weigh it. You, <laughs> what was the weight with the, with the belly split open from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife? Because that's, that's crazy that uh, they didn't take a moment to actually look. Yeah, so it, it should have been probably a four pound fish easily you know it was 3.09 or 3.9 pound it wasn't like ounces if it was ounces it'd be a lot it would be like 3.15 maybe one four ounces it would convert to so yeah it definitely should have been at least a four pound fish um, and I think we you know we weighed it even after that and it might have lost just a tad from the slime going in and out of the you know the plastic bag that it was in so uh, I was like, okay, well, our first official weight was 3.9. We'll keep it at that. In college, I did take a class. You know, I wanted to be a fisheries, uh, 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 have a fisheries degree, so I took some fisheries classes. So ichthyology was one of them, and we went out and collected fish as part of the homework. So we had, like, you collect as many fish heads as you can. And that year, I was actually lucky enough to see pink salmon going up the Onion Creek uh, River up in Bayfield, and that's the first time I've seen pinks, you know, they, but they were, you could tell they were pink because the males had a hump back and they were spawning right in front of the creek. And I didn't even know that they were there. Yeah, that, that, that's super cool. So you weigh the fish, you got the weight at this point, you do what? Do you go and look online to see what the uh, record is or, or how, how'd you proceed forward to get it certified and all of that? Uh, well, previously we, you know, I, I, before I went to the store to get a weight, I kind of, I had to make sure that it was at least close to the record mm -hmm. and then um i got back home um i you know had to contact the dnr and ended up getting sent texting the picture to vic santucci uh dale bowman actually gave me his phone number and he said you know send this to vic and then about 10 o'clock at night he calls me back and he's like yeah we're gonna send a biologist to verify it uh, to make sure that you know, it is a pink. Mm -hmm. He said, by the looks of it from the picture, it is a pink. So later the next day, um, the a representative from the DNR came over to my work. I had to fish in the cooler, and they came out. She came out and weighed and measured the fish and verified that it was a pink salmon. Must have been a good feeling. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So and, and, and this whole time I'm telling Alex, you know, like, hey, listen, you know, you you caught a fish. <laughs> it's a state record. Did, it, uh, did the clients really care too much? Didn't, uh, I don't think it phased them until, like, I think someone, like, Dale called him up for an interview. And then it, I think it, he started to realize, like, oh, this is a big deal. It's a big yeah. deal in the fishing community, yes. for sure. And for the fishing community. I was really excited for him. Like, I wanted him to get this record. Like, like, dude, I need you. I, we need to meet up. And you need to sign this paperwork and, yeah. and turn it in. You know, I want you to get this record. Right. Get the credit. Yeah. And all of that. Um, so then that happens. It sets off then, uh, you know, this explosion from our England community, you know, looking to then get get in on the action and, and you know, find the pink for themselves. Some people were actually purposely trying to target them um, in, in their attempts to, you know, one up yes. that, that new record. <laughs> a few Three weeks later or so, maybe a month. Uh, there was a boat, uh, was it Confusion again? Yep, Confusion Charter. Confusion, which has the current state late trout record in Illinois anyway, right? Yep. They they did that last year or the year mm -hmm. before um, as well. But uh, then on their boat, they caught one that, what, what was like that weight? five pounds something. So it was almost like a full pounder yeah. over bigger. Yep. And, and right when we set the record, it was still, you know, early in the year and i figured right away you know i don't know how long this is going to stand you did say that yes, yeah to be did. fair when, yep. when you brought it us and you were like yeah i don't think this holds yeah. too long there's so many of them you know eventually that started showing up the only thing i thought was okay you know usually these fish i've caught one in the past it was a smaller one not even close to a record and but then that was the only one and so i figured maybe these fish will stay here for two weeks three weeks tops and then they'll be gone, and then the record might might stand for at least a, another couple of years. Right, another you know, cycle as they, cycle. As they move around. Um, that was pretty cool. Then, then when that happened, it did, it just further intensified the the hunt for the the big the big uh, pink salmon here. Um, and of course, you know, we were bombarded with a lot of questions. What do you do? How do you target them? Which is 
uh, what I want to ask you know either one of you to, to talk on is is there any difference in targeting uh, pinks versus coho? Uh, if you know in your spreads and all that, how does that work? For like I said, the, the one that we caught was on a stubby with a blue liz on a dipsy, but we've also gotten them on from a, from that to a ten color, you know, with a mag spoon, and. On the same day, I've had friends send me pictures in 75 feet of water while I'm out in 250, also catching them. So they were definitely all over. There was not a single pattern for them. That's interesting because this is uh, this is July, right? Mm -hmm. when, when I first, yeah, because you said salmon and ramble. So this is July time period. I do remember we, we had a, a longer cold period. So the water was colder far, halfway into June, the water was still pretty cold. So by salmon and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. The water was okay. It was warming up, but it wasn't like we had a, we had a thermocline set at that point. Yeah, it was a little more predictable setup, right? Yeah. So uh, I bring that up to say that these fish you're catching them out way off in the 200s plus. Guys are still catching them inside the hill. I mean, I was on the kayak inside the hill mm -hmm. inside of 80 or so, and, and I would you know run into them. So it seems like uh, it, at least based off of that, that they're, they're not, uh, too picky on maybe perhaps the water temperature. Do they, do they seem to act different than some of the other, uh, salmon species in terms of what they're willing to kind of sit in and, and, and all of that? You know, it, I, I, I tried to put some sense into it, but I, I just couldn't figure it out. And like I said, they, you know, they're one day you're catching them on a copper and the next day they're, they're on the three collar and, well, I mean, I'm pretty guilty of using a lot of um, bloody nose last year. Oh, I'm at a two, three on the spread <laughs> minimum. <laughs> so, and they were a lot of people were <laughs> listen. By, by by and large, bloody nose was the spoon mm -hmm. of 2022 yeah. so, for sure. We we sold out endless amounts of them. It was talked about widely, and yeah. uh, those that are in the know were running two, three, four, four yeah, like so in the spreads. So. They seem to prefer the bloody nose. And it didn't matter if it was the regular or the Magnum or the RV. You know, I, 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 every time I'd lose it, I'd just grab one and, you know, whatever it was in stock here, I'd, you know, if, if it's the UV or RV or non-RV. And they definitely, yes, I could say that they had preference for that, for the bloody nose. But mm -hmm. I think maybe one came on a flounder pounder also. And maybe uh, another one on a, uh, a stinger. Um, Blue dolphin. Yeah. So we've got this, I, I don't know. Um, for me, I didn't know that this fish existed before this year, and I'm sure many other people didn't know either. Um, w w what do you guys think as far as expectations on the pink salmon uh, going forward? Um, numbers and will it fish the same? Was this like a fluke year? And, and uh, this is totally just you know, obviously opinion and thoughts on it because it's all new to us, you know, and I don't even think a lot of these DNR from any of the states probably have much info on them. I would, I'm I assuming. don't think they really pay much attention to right. them. And, uh, you know, I, I think what we've seen, I mean, we've seen them for years, but they've definitely become more prominent the last like three, like four. Like numbers wise, right? That's you know, right. And then la this year was incredible how many were caught. But I remember seeing better amounts last year and a year before that so i mean the trend is going up with them for sure and then you see how good the the river fishing they had up north for them in the fall and their right. spawning was spectacular yeah. they did they, that was like a real uh it was kind of quiet as kept thing yeah i know you got a lot of pictures of people you sent me some when they when they get the hump and real beautiful you yeah know, when they got like that do you do you uh jerry do you think that rise in the pink coincides with what we're seeing with our owlwife population. And by the way, if you haven't checked out the previous episode <laughs> where we break down the whole history of the owlwives, there might have been a little bit of, of, of misinformation <laughs> in some of that, but uh, uh, we, we kind of corrected it. But um, no, but it, it ties in perfectly. I mean, we, we've seen now really good owlwife populations for what, six, seven classes of, of owlwives from the little guys to the big, big magnums. Um, Obviously, these fish are gonna what they eat. They're gonna eat owlwives as well. They're gonna eat bugs and or yeah. Do they, have, do they have a certain forage they have? I mean, technically, they're supposed to be more like plankton feeder type fish, you know. Okay. And um, but yeah, they're gonna have to eat owlwives here or any kind type of bait fish. But generally, concentrating on owlwives, um, they probably found a river somewhere to spawn and naturally reproduce in Lake Michigan because like before they were mostly in Lake Superior and starting to spread. 
and from you know from the current river where they were stocked or unintentionally stocked they seem to just go to a, the next river, the next river and spawn to see if they could spread. So eventually they must have spread somewhere in Lake Michigan where they're able to spawn successfully. And this is an awesome year class that we've seen and hopefully you know, it's, it's gonna keep on happening. Uh, the spawning cycle was supposed to be two, every two, three years. So we would see them and then one year and, two, and, and then two, three years later, they'll come back. But you know, there's some articles that are reporting that they might even be a yearly um, occurrence now, because there was only one year class stock. But you know, not all fish will spawn at the same time. Kind of like might skip a year, so they could yeah. fill that void and become so not staggers. It could be a yearly event, or still a majority would be two three year cycle. It's it's um it's interesting, right? These fish were put in up in Superior, you said, mm -hmm. right? And now here they are down all the way, you know, our way down in uh, southern Lake Michigan. Uh, obviously, we know salmon species as a whole, they're known to travel around. Yeah. Okay? You know, no matter what state stocks them, they're going to go wherever they want to go in the lake. And that's kind of what it is. But it it is incredible, though. Like, when you think about all the water they had to cover to end up down here. Um, and then, as you said, you know, they're looking for, you know, rivers to spawn in uh i don't know I, I, this is one of those where I, i'm thinking i'm thinking through the process of my head they start maybe coming down maybe it's a food thing they find more food down here mm -hmm. closer down this way uh then you've got the more pristine waters on michigan rivers rather in michigan yeah. that feed in and so maybe that was a factor that they found you know favorable and maybe that's why they're starting to build a population down here because they kind of get a little bit of everything they want they got the rivers they've got good forage population mm -hmm. stuff so it, again this is just all us just thinking of the southern half together. of the lake is typically more fertile than the north half yeah so that's going to be more of the bugs and microorganisms that they like to eat and we got the green and we here. got the green water yeah you know and, and that there's a lot of talk about how that green water t tends to be very favorable I, I think you said there's like some kind of a saying too in, with, as far as green water and salmon do you remember do you remember it do you, you know what i'm talking about Oh, yeah, what Fuzzy said. But basically, if you see green water, you fish it. There's me king's there. I forgot oh, yeah. his exact saying. Yeah, but. it was a really good one. Unfortunately, I deleted that video. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, so we'll talk about that on another podcast. <laughs> Sorry, Fuzz, we got to get you back on here. We, we, uh, it happens. Yeah, so I think it benefits the pinks, too. And like most salmon, you know, the, the common knowledge or belief that they're going to always come back to the natal streams where they were, they were uh, hatched or stocked. You know, but not all fish will do that. I mean, how many times have we found a dead king on a creek that there's absolutely no stocking going on, but there's king that will end up there. Yeah. So, and like I said earlier, I was like hoping that these fish would be gone in two weeks. Record's going to hold. But then we started to see even in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, pinks coming back, the males with the humps, downtown Chicago. So they, they never left. You know, they had no intention of going back to their natal stream wherever that might have been good so they're they go down they like an area they 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 stuck around hoping to be able to spawn down here somewhere so is it is it more of like um they're here and they're here to stay some of them like residential decided, yeah some potentially? of them decide like hey you know let's try to find a stream to spawn here even though they're not going to be successful here probably because we on this side of the lake anyways we don't have any streams that are yeah, like capable they, yeah. of you know supporting natural reproduction. I mean, they can't they can't spawn in the Chicago River. <laughs> 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 well, the Chicago River will work for them. Oh darn it! Oh, uh, I know it, it would have been nice. So even in the Pike it would have been nice. in Kenosha. I mean, yes. listen, the, the Chicago River. Not to sidetrack too hard here, but it's become an incredible carp fishery. There's a real big like subset of anglers. You see them in like the fishing groups that are hardcore carp fishing. So. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, the river won't support that. The Chicago <laughs> River. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's it's super cool. Uh, here we are going into 2023, and and it seems like we're just learning something new about this wonderful fishery that we have. Uh, that's come a long way. That's gone through adversities, um, ups and downs, and for all intents and purposes, we're definitely on like an upward swing. All right. And and obviously we all hope that that continues to go, um, and uh, not to dive into this at this particular point. But then there's the uh, the the new consent decree that's been come out that's been starting to get make its rounds and talked about in the fish communities. And 
I think maybe perhaps we'll we'll try to talk about that in the coming episode because yeah i think that needs to be its own thing yeah it needs to be its own things for sure but uh and, and so for those who are not sure what's going on right now we'll we'll cover it uh i did my own standalone thing on it on, on my personal channel but uh i'm looking forward to getting in here with some more captains doing a round table because there's definitely potential i don't say that uh, potential for have for it to have impact on on the water and, and the fishery and all of that um Kind of moving along, Jer, uh, how, overall, outside the pinks, how did uh, 2022 fish for you? Oh, it's pretty good. Especially comparing to the last year, the year before that. Definitely improving every year. Um, and, you know, like 10 years ago, we always almost thought that, you know, we we're pretty much done here for salmon. You know, if you catch one or two kings a day, and we had that mentality that it, it's almost like musky fishing for kings. You know, you get one here, one there. And then we got spoiled, you know. It, mm -hmm. you, Basically, fish the hill early morning, and you got two, three, four, or five kings. You're like, Hoke, this is good. That's a good morning, you know. And, and then you fill it up with coves the rest of the morning. So we we're definitely on an upswing. Um, you know, hopefully it continues, like you guys said, continues that way. And you know, we're always at the mercy of water temps, but it, you know, we have a good harbor here. Um, you know, Waukegan, Kenosha, Winthrop Harbor, definitely a good area for for holding fish. Uh, throughout most of the year let me ask you this for the last few years for sure it's been pretty impressive how well waukegan has been fishing and, and and honestly giving the best opportunity for our illinois anglers that you know a lot of guys will cross over but there's a lot of guys that don't cross over the, the border mm -hmm. and and even we'll tell people like if you want better chances cross over the border just because it's a numbers game they stock more it's yeah. more likely that they're gonna have more come back mm -hmm. more uh, places to fish yeah, you know, more yeah. room to spread out, more spots, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Even though it gets crowded, but you, there's still overall just more more room to kind of go, go out there. Um, but for Illinois and our guys that are you know um, here in Illinois that don't cross over, that stick to our our, our waterways here. I mean, it's no question. Waukegan's been killing it the last couple of years. What what do you think it is about Waukegan that has been performing so well uh, these last couple of years? I think it, the access is the biggest key. You know, you have a, 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 a good good access on the piers. Um, you can't really go out and fish. It's hard to fish the rocks in Winthrop Harbor. So, and traditionally, Waukegan's always been uh, the better pier uh, or place to fish for shore anglers. And it does receive a heavier stocking uh, from the DNR. And I think even now, before it freezes, there's still quite a few steelhead being caught. You know, and traditionally, November, December, even back in the 90s, you know, when I was a kid, that's the time to go get steelhead, like even right now. Yeah, in the cold, know, nasty weather. Yeah, before yeah. it freezes, you know, shrimp and a bobber or, bobber, you know, or skein, you know, steelhead will eat that, you know, no question. So it's definitely access and it does have the best access and the higher number of stockings, you know, for, for the state. For, for Illinois. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know if that says too much because – I mean, really, all you have you have Waukegan. Then there's like a big gap for the most part up yep. until you get until I would say uh, Montrose. Is there anything between Montrose? Sure, and I'm talking about for access for shore and boat guys. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's it, right? Yeah. So you you just got a huge gap. You know, some folks will fish out of uh, Park Forest. No, Lake Forest. Lake, Lake Forest. Lake Forest is it right? Yeah. Some some there, but 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 it's Waukegan. Then there's and then there's Montrose. And then you've got all the downtown stuff, and, and that's great for shore guys, but it's not really accessible for boat for boaters. It's such a pain to fish out of the summer if you don't already have a slip, you know, for, right. for like a trail trailable boat guys, you know, because it's expensive. And then you want to go fish, and then that day you go, to, you decide to go fish. There's some kind of city event. They shut down the access to the launch. You're like, oh my, you can't win. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, you can tell stuff. clearly. I've been through this. It's been very, yeah. It's such a. Uh, it's, Just top on ninety four and. Head up to Waukegan or Winthrop Harbor, you know. Yeah. It, it, less, you pay less to to launch your boat and a lot easier access. And Ten dollars less. Although I would love to see it come down a little bit more. <laughs> Jesus. Um, and yeah, Waukegan even for uh, for coho fishing was pretty amazing this year. Yeah. I found mm -hmm. myself right. No, it was consistent all year. Yeah. Was Waukegan consistent. was really consistent all year, mm -hmm. which is great because then it gives guys opportunities. You know, obviously shore guys. It's a big, a popular kayak spot. Mm -hmm. Kayak anglers, and obviously, we know the boat guys as well. Um, how much of it do you think is because it's proximity to 
Wisconsin, and you know the obviously they're putting in a lot more fish. You got Kenosha, Racine, relatively not far in terms of like when you think about the the amount of uh, uh, room or not room, but uh, the amount of uh, area of these fish will kind of cover. So it's very likely they could just skip the harbor and come wander into Waukegan. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really a planted fish here, but they're kind of Waukegan potentially picks up scrap, you know, the scraps from uh, Wisconsin, perhaps. Oh yeah, they wander. I mean it. These fish, once, you know, as long as they're not in a staging mode, they're, they're going to wander. You know, we get fish probably from Huron early, the kings from Huron early early spring in May that pass through us here. I'm, I, I really believe that those are Huron fish that, that come down. They don't stick around in May. They just kind of breeze through here. And so they'll wander wherever they can, where they can find food. You know, they got to find food. And same thing with co-hosts. Most of our co-hosts, I believe, are from Michigan. You know, they, they come here. They have good good water temps. They got good food. And I know the guys from Michigan <laughs> on Michigan side are always saying, stop killing our fish. Wait. So we got to thank the Michigan guys for this. Do you think a lot of them can you, can you break that down just so me and those watching kind of understand this or have a better understanding of the statement? You're saying you believe most of the coho come from the Michigan side. Do you mean via stocking or do you mean for, via natural reproduction? Because there, there, there's seems to be the belief that they're that a lot of these salmon are producing pretty well over there, right? Isn't that what we've been hearing? Or am that's I what they've been saying for years. Um, but historically, Michigan always stocked the most cohos by a, a wide margin, and then we got the in the spring we would. Why is that? Um, is there any reason behind it? Or? We just didn't stock as many as them, and I'm not really sure exactly why they stock so many compared to the other states. I think if you break down like the area the, for quotas, they, they do have a bigger slice of the lake mm-hmm. um, to cover. So if you, I mean, if you okay, that makes versus sense. us in Indiana, we're the smallest. And, yeah. And Wisconsin There's definitely has bigger. And we got to take advantage of it because the fish would mainly, you know, early in the spring start down in Indiana and then come up our side. And stay around here more so we were really the ones that benefited from their major stocking kind of put it all together right they they stock them over there maybe you know there's a percentage of them that reproduce naturally over there start down to indiana and then how you said they come up our side i wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that we've got that green water mm-hmm. and it's very nutrient rich and there's a lot of stuff going on in there that they hang out on our side for yep that may april I mean, what what period do the Michigan side guys get into coho? Because I, I know for them, well, it's very, it seems, at least from, and again, I haven't fished over there, but just from what I see on social media, and, you know, that there's certain periods where those fish are in there and they get to have them and then they're gone. And well, yeah, the, the fish case. move around a lot faster on the other side. Like, they're in one port and they're gone the next day and much quicker than, like, we have here. But um, we did see the last few years they were catching more and more cohos on that side of the lake, like more fish kind of making their way up from what I was told at least you know just talking to fishermen over there and selling them coho dodgers and stuff that they never had to use before (laughs) so they they, we did see an increase of guys on that side of the lake kind of catch on to the stubbies Mm -hmm. so it's not so much a our area secret so much anymore so the word's kind of getting out on the lake as a whole that like stubbies are like the way to go with coho it's like that's super cool yeah even in the past I would run like one you know one stubby and the rest were this year i at least three, you know, one on the Dipsy, one on the Rigger, and they even put one on a Copper towards the end. And that was a hot one. A lot, a lot of guys were running uh, stubbies throughout the year, not way past the spring. Yeah, and, and catch, using them to catch kings, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, not just coal. It's using the, the chrome and the smoke and those colors to target kings. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little painful when that king snaps off. A, yeah. <laughs> a stubby on, <laughs> you put on 17-pound test, and there he goes, you know, like, Rob, you got more? <laughs> <laughs> Those things are pro- well, they're probably the hardest things to keep in here by, by, yeah. by far. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The hardest. So when we have them, we'll post them up. <laughs> Just he's got to get them while we have them. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Illinois, uh, Waukegan for sure definitely stand it out with the, uh, with the fishing. What about uh, – how did – what are your thoughts about the kings, the king fishing in our area specifically – um, how do you think it, or what was your experience with it? How, how did it fish for you? There's definitely a lot of kinks on the hill in the morning. You just have to, you know, you have to stick with it. You know, you can't just go there for an hour or two. Although, yes, yeah, some, some charter captains do make it look easy. You know, they'll dump in two, three rods right there, fish for kings, catch one or two, maybe three, and then head, head straight east. 
that seems to be a good uh, early morning program. But if you stuck around and just want to target kings, you can fish there pretty much till late morning. Even if you want all day, they're going to be around there. But your chances are definitely better first light. Um, you know, we would target kings every, almost every trip right there on the hills right, or right on the edge and, you know, expect to catch at least two, three. And then before we had, we, we either troll east or pack up and run and then reset in about 150 or 200 and then fish for coals. And this is not in May, you know, it's basically June, July, the even into period. August. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's one thing I, I learned this year, um, especially because I, I added live scope to my setup was that, um, Though there's still plenty of fish, even in some of that warmer water, uh, you know, inside the hill, on top of the hill, you know, and all that stuff. So that, like you said, if you put in the time, you can still pluck some fish out of there. Now, whether or not it's going to happen as fast as you would if you went off short a little bit more and slid out to deeper water, mm -hmm. that may be a, a, a different kind of a, you know, experience. Um, this year was also the first year that you got your captain's license, right? Uh, was it? Oh, actually, I've got year. it had it since twenty ten ish. But yeah, but you but, started running. Oh, trips. I, I, yeah, ran uh, trips again. Um, you know, I, I I ran some trips for uh, Captain Bob Rosa back you know a long time ago, and uh, as a first mate, and then I ran some afternoon trips, and then I took a break when the kids were, or the twins were born, and I figured I'd give it another ch uh, go here on my own. So I started doing trips again this year. So walk us through what's the experience been like, do you, you know, what, and it's especially on the pressures of it, because you got people paying you to essentially catch fish. And I, we all know that, you you know, you can't obviously guarantee the fish are going to bite. Gary always catches fish, so there's no pressure. Well, yeah. listen, let me set up the question, Rob. <laughs> you know, it, the point is, though, there's, it, there is a certain level of pressure, internal pressure. Is, is there not? Oh, there is. And, um, one good thing is, you know, the network, you know, we, we you know, I, I work with Rob, Phil and, you know, Diamond Ghost, you know, and some of the other got captains on the dock, you know, we, we talk all the, almost all the time and, and the, uh, having a good network definitely helps. Our, our Facebook page, the, you know, from Lake Michigan Angler to the Winthrop Waukegan uh, salmon fishing page, I mean, you can just sit there and watch it, watch the bite happen, you know, watch it evolve from what people are doing. Um, but yes, you got to have a good network and I'm all probably the most pessimistic captain. Cause when the guys, I meet them on a dock, you know, I don't, I don't, I trailer my boat. So I'll meet them on a dock. I'm like, yeah, if we catch eight fish a day, it's probably going to be a good day, you know? And then we end up with like 20, 25, you know, or 15 to get a three man limit. I see what you're doing there. You know, it's, it's the whole but, uh, un, uh, <laughs> under promise over deliver. It's a very good <laughs> strategy. Right? I'm on to no, you, dude. I'm on to you. But, you know, it's, it's only it only goes up, you know. But it's always like, okay, it looks like it's it was a tough day yesterday. But hopefully, you know, if, if we get every day, if you get five to eight fish, you know, when it when it's June, July, then you're like, we had a good day. In May, yeah, you can pretty much count on getting your limit. But you know, I, I it's fishing. Everyone's an all star in May. Yes, <laughs> like, every, let's be honest, everyone's an all star in May. Yes, and then you're gonna have those days where you know you're you're struggling to find fish, and like I said, that's where you know you you gotta have a good network of guys that are willing to share good information back and forth to make you make life easier. You know, we're not fishing for walleyes in the chain where yeah, you gotta you get you know you don't want to tell people to go to Suicide Alley or crab apple and let me get my write this down right now. I'm sorry <laughs> and, and plug <laughs> any other ones you want at the walls put in the gps <laughs> coordinates for me why don't you you know so it's not like or it's, it's not like walleye fishing you know in a small inland lake it's lake michigan you know other than the hill and you know the mesa and the reef the fish are you know they're pelagic fish are swimming they're kicking their tail looking for food that is uh th that is one of the the cooler things about fishing Lake Michigan is is generally speaking guys will be more open to, to giving you some they might not tell you exactly right like the GPS coordinates of where but they'll give you hey and you know, I found fish in this depth range and uh, I use this you know so that you can at least get a starting point whereas inland fishing is very different because mm -hmm. way smaller bodies of water right. everyone's trying to compete in in you know for some few spots so people can be w way more guarded and uh some folks even use you know what i call diversionary tactics oh yeah i caught them on uh you know i caught them on uh uh woolly booger remember that old school <laughs> lure you know yeah and the whole time they were using 
a jerk bait, you know. I mean, for like Michigan, and it, it, you just need to know what level. You know, that, that's the biggest question I, I ask, or you know, if captains like what level, or you'll hear in the radio what's your level. So you know, one twenty to one sixty. So the fish are generally going to be in that area. And if you want to get more technical, what's your what's your angle? What you know, what direction are you trolling? So. I, you know, those are the two, even from the past, past podcast, like with Captain Sean, and to him, that's the most important thing is depth and angle. So I do pay attention a lot, you know, when I see other captains on the bigger boat uh, troll, I just want to, I kind of want to see the area they're trolling and then the angle that they're doing. And I'm not going to get right on them, but, you know, I'll be half a mile, a mile away from them and try to mimic the same. Right direction and angle and depth and then you watch them are they still doing the 60 to 120 or are they now doing the 100 to 180 you know as the, you can see the fish move through the, uh, the progression during the day as they move deeper you know instead of just kind of getting right next to them you just kind of mimic exactly what they're doing you know the fish will bite different lures you know they're not always going to bite well, they are always going to bite the, the body nose. But, you know, you, you can always get those fish to bite whatever spread you have. You're going to attract them. You don't have to get right on a big charter boat and, you know, steal his line. But yeah. I feel like I can probably be more successful on my own spread versus trying to compete with his spread anyway, you know. Perfect setup for this next question. I want to preface it by saying um, we did an amazing small boat video with you, really popular on, on, on our YouTube channel. Um, obviously, a lot of guys are in small, you know, small trailable boats, yeah. fishing the lake. So just want to take a moment to say if you've not checked out the video we did with Captain Jerry, uh, we'll link to it down below in the, uh, in the uh, description so you can check it out if you're a small boat angler. Um, really useful. Um, and with that being said, we don't want to dive deep into it because they can always yeah. watch that video, but you know, in terms of controlling your angle in a small boat, um, some people might not, not not know may not know the little technique you, you have set up where you utilize your trolling motor and along with like your kicker motor to control your uh, your boat. And I, I believe you have autopilot as well, correct? Yeah. So could you just talk briefly um, just on how to utilize that kind of a setup for anybody that might have something similar or may look into doing that for better boat control? Well, and like the advantage yeah. of having like the trolling motor in versus just only the kicker. Right. And yeah, the trolling motor basically makes it a lot easier since it has an autopilot, you know, to keep your heading and the direction that you're heading, you know, straight. And the the problem is when the wind picks up and it's blowing you sideways, and so you're kind of crabbing to the side a little bit, you can actually help yourself by uh, 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 turning your kicker motor either, you know, left or right to compensate for that or that drift. Drift, yeah. And then watch your uh, dipsies to make sure that they're both uh, putting the same amount of, getting the same amount of pressure as you're trolling through the water. And there are days when one dipsy keeps firing, but if you look at it, it's actually bending a lot more than the dipsy, let's say on the port side. So that means your port side dipsy is not getting the same traction as your starboard side. So you, that's where you'd have to play with the angles of the trolling motor. I try to keep my trolling motor in the front as straight as possible because if it's sometimes you'll see it, it's it's almost 90 degrees. That's a lot of vibration moving through the water. Just my belief, it probably could spook a lot more fish than if it's running straight and less vibration. Got you. Um, my next question is, you've got two riggers and two dipsies. What's on all of them? That's all you can fish. And, you know, Probably I'd run at least a combination of spoons and dodgers. Well, give, give me give me give me a specific. What's on each one? You got two riggers and two 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 dipsies. One could be high, one could be low. It doesn't matter. But those you only have four rods and those for the are, entire year. For the entire for year. The entire <laughs> year. What what is on them? There's definitely gonna be a, a you know a stubby with a blue lids or green lids. That, that's definitely my favorite. And like Wait, on which one though? Like yeah, and literally like which rod has that? That one? would be on the port side. Okay. Uh, and and then dipsy on the port side dipsy okay. yeah. uh, so one would probably be uh you know a, a power pro braid dipsy 40 pound and then the other one has to be wire okay um every year i get a favorite uh flasher but dragon slayer <laughs> with a with a bullfrog or you know or a, a customized bullfrog of sort you know i, I do i like to add some kind of glow to it but you know, it, it, just a regular bullfrog so run that on the on the, the wire dipsy, dipsy okay. 100, 120 back. Two riggers? 
to a rigor, it's the same thing. I would probably, you know, I would pair a, uh, put a spoon, bloody nose on one, and okay. probably same thing, put a stubby on the other one or some kind of flasher. So it would flasher or stubby? Yeah. And I try to keep, you know, if I have a, if I have a flasher on one rigger, I try to keep a spoon on the other, unless it's a flasher. Button. I was going to ask, yeah, it, it seems like you're, you're more, uh, you lean more on flashers and, and dodgers as opposed to spoons. Is that, is that fair to say? On my dipsies, yeah, I usually utilize flashers and dodgers on the, on the dipsy and then run more spoons on the, on the riggers. Gotcha. Unless, you know, it's a flasher bite, then definitely have a flasher. So, switch them out, right? All right. And I'm sure if we expanded it out to, like, your boards, then you'd probably have more spoons on some yeah. like core coppers and stuff like that. Right. Got it. And, uh, yeah, I've, like I said, I run probably the most basic, boring stuff. But I also, it's almost like a baseball lineup. You want stuff that, you know, the highest percentage uh, batters on your lineup. Yeah. So I, I generally stick to what works until I... Rob's like, oh, this is a super hot spoon. I'm down to like two of them. So then, yes, I'll put one of those. Should, should we tell Jerry now at this point that, the, that we're trolling him when we do that? Like, hey, we're bored today. And it's called Jerry Tone. That this purple melon atomic dog a spoon is the hot color. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Man, Jerry, then everyone caught fish on this new lure, this new uh, this color, and no one's ever seen it or heard of it. Well, I mean, a lot of times I'll sit here in the store, like, you know, I'm not saying I'm bored, but you know, if I'm not fishing, I'm sitting here, especially when the captains are done for the day and they come in here and they rack, like, six spoons of one yeah, color yeah and you know that like oh look, Jer jerry is notorious <laughs> listen, uh, <laughs> and you look over like jerry you leave me one? listen <laughs> jerry i noticed this jerry will linger around over the aisle and just peek his head over the aisle and just see, for see, hours like, he'll, just, <laughs> he'll spend hours here just spying on other people <laughs> jerry the spy <laughs> Hey, they gotta be his new name. See what Captain, they're buying, Captain Spy. <laughs> and I'm like, Rob, I know your inventory better than you. <laughs> I remember one time, it was, it was Captain was, was he just came and dumped a bunch of spoons on me and, and cashing them out and everything like that. And he goes and Jerry wanders over. It's like, what spoons were those? <laughs> I know they, they usually have them like facing downward, <laughs> and I just go over there and knock them. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> These are like the little tactics, that, and it, 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 it's it's funny for sure. It's definitely funny because there's other cats that have their own ways that they'll sit here and they're like shooting the breeze with you, but they're watching the other guys as they buy their stuff. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, like it, it's it's pretty. It's one of those funny observations that that we notice as well. I've been literally just asked for a copy of somebody else's receipt. Really? <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> On numerous occasions. Well, we're not going to name names, but there was a one incident where. Uh, another captain peeked into another captain's basket, and it was not pretty. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, it's serious out here, guys. I don't want you to know what they got in their in their uh, in their spoon box. Um, <laughs> Just need a bloody nose. Well, you know, it was again. It was that was easily the best color spoon in our area. Moonshine bloody nose yes. for sure. I'm curious to see how it holds up next year. Yeah, you know, and, and if there's one that just... That it's always been a good one, but it just for sure. but this stick year around just, for a lot longer this year where it was like the South was, Spoon. It was unless consistent. it was on the box stuff where it didn't catch anything. <laughs> <ever>. <laughs> yeah, one thing I noticed about, and shout out to Phil, one thing I noticed on, on, on the box stuffer is when everyone is catching something on whatever color, it isn't working the same on the boat. No. And then you'll catch something on like this random pro troll from the 80 Spoon. <laughs> Like, like, and I look at him like this is a thing. I'm like, all right. it's it, but it's it's like that. Like, mm -hmm. it's different for everyone. Yeah, yeah. two years ago was uh, the uh, Dirty Oz Roadkill was was hot, and this year just wasn't yeah, it wasn't that, that great. That's definitely year. a go to for for and the box this year. It was not a go to anymore. Yeah, for but uh, I forgot which one was now. We had a few. They just kind of came, you know, get two weeks out of a spoon that would be a killer and then it would die and be going to move on to the next spoon blue, blue flounder yep was not as hot this exactly year. blue flounder did not work good but dance and anchovy did mm -hmm. and they're both blue yeah blue you know the, spots that, that's uh man blue flounder did pretty good it did better for me than dancing anchovy um and blue hulk actually did really well for me in in june and july mm -hmm. so I, for me I, I know i told rob before i may have said on the podcast before but um one of those observations i made for myself is in July, the blues start to really do well for me. Blue, you know, blue and spoons, blue, 
uh, Dance and Chovy, Blue Flounder, uh, Blue Hulk. Um, you, do you notice any kind of trends like that? Maybe some period of time where certain colors. I think tend this to... year for for me was anything with spots. Okay, was definitely good on on flashers, especially uh, the two face the, with the bright green spots. That's the two face, right? Yeah, yeah. That one was a really good uh, flasher for me for kings. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, Jer, I think we've we've talked about everything we wanted to talk about for today which is great and definitely touching on that that peeing salmon um kind of run and you know what's happening here it's definitely gonna be interesting to see what happens next year you know are they gonna be around again uh will there be another fish caught that breaks you know records and stuff like that because uh you know the truth is the the lake is in a really healthy space Mm -hmm. we're already almost at the end of the year you know as as of the taping of this we're we're like hour to week before christmas yeah a week before christmas so merry christmas to everyone yep. um but uh so far winter has been fairly mild we're just about to get some cold yep. real cold stuff coming up which is probably going to freeze up the mm-hmm. lake and or at least the harbors and stuff but it doesn't seem what they're saying like it doesn't seem like we're going to have a horrible winter which is seems to be a good thing for the for the for the fish you know yeah um, so that i say that to say that going into next year it's a, if it's a mild winter if it's a stable winter could set it up for these fish to just keep on eating and growing and come back in the spring. I'm really curious to see, though, in the spring, you know, when we talk about spring fishing, a lot of times guys are starting the spring fishing down in Indiana waters in like or as early as February. Some, you know, some of the places don't freeze over at all. So you can fish those areas in March for sure. You'll start seeing guys, more and more guys out um, fishing. And you'll see like our, our early spring cookie cutter coho, which are in like that. 16 to 20 22 inches range right like the one to three occasionally four pounder you know i'm really curious to see after we saw like the the giants calls that we did this year if we see a bigger size in the spring and do you think that's possible or yeah it's it's always possible you know and hopefully we get a good year class of alibis to for those fish to feed on and we'll see bigger fish um the Kings were a little bit disappointing this year. You know, I know you guys touched on that yeah. earlier. That's podcast. why I asked you about the King thing, because they were around, but the size. You got the smaller. Was... The size of the yeah. ones we got yeah. here were smaller, but up yeah. north, I mean. They, they were monsters yeah. up they north. They were monsters yeah. up north. I know, I know during Salmonorama, they were not even looking at 20-pound fish. Mm-hmm. You know, they were looking at it. They would only try to weigh something over 25. I mean, they, they caught so many big fish. Yep. So, but yeah, hopefully we'll get we'll get our fish again. You know, we usually do down here in our harbors. You know, we're fortunate to to have that. Um, on a side note, you know, we talked about the pink salmon being that unique fish. But the next thing that I, I'd really would like to see are the coaster brook trout or brook trout that oh, they're yeah. stocking. So that could be you know future down the line. Hopefully, and we'll we do that. have a future podcast about that oh, coming good. somewhat soon. Nice. Um, didn't wasn't in the previous episode we had with uh oh god uh, arnie talked about them they did was, was yeah was it arnie who said that they stocked them way up they stocked in green bay or something they like stocked that? them in milwaukee and manitowoc, and manitowoc. No, 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 but didn't he say something to the fact they stocked them way up and then they they found them down in our area or down this way so they they, they, they kind of, found them i mean they, they stocked them in the two rivers and they have found them all over the place so they've been caught in the root They've been caught in various places. They haven't been stocked. They they moved around quite a bit. But those right now, the ones we have are not coasters. Um, they're just regular brook trout. They're just regular brook trout. Oh, so what's what's so the difference here? The oh. coasters are another um, a, discussion ahead of like as far as stocking goes. But I'll let Jerry explain the difference between a coaster and a regular brook trout. Yeah, I worked for a fish hatchery in college in Red Cliff in you know the tribal hatchery that actually has got. Nipigon strain, what they call the coaster, but you know, fish and wildlife would also argue that they're just regular brook trout. So coasters are basically like steelhead, you know, wherein they they're stocked or they they're raised in the streams, and then they go to the lake. They they're a migratory version of the brook trout, so they get a lot bigger, okay. uh, five six pounds. Uh, I know that some of the Nipigon strains get get pretty big. So. The, I was kind of hoping that that's what they stocked, but even the ones they stocked here, if they're regular brook trout, they so far some of the pictures I've seen, they're pretty big. They're pre- yeah, they're pretty good size. I mean, they were stocked at a size that's basically an adult brook trout for most of the country. Right. You know, they're getting they were stocked in there like two, at two, eight two. to ten inches, oh. which you know, little 
streams in most of the country is like as big as they, yeah that's about as big as they get so we got them in there put it put them in there at that size so they're they had a really good start to their life in the lake and yeah. we've seen some you know i've seen some two pound fish caught already mm-hmm. yeah that's that's pretty cool because i i do remember arnie saying that these fish will tend to hang around um, more locally mm-hmm. and will feed on bugs and so it's a good opportunity for the shore anglers and uh they're more residential, I believe is what you said? Yeah, they're going to stick to shore. They're going to stay. They'll travel up and down the, the shoreline like we've seen. We've seen these fish that were already stocked that they've been caught in other places. But they typically stay near shore. Um, we used to be able to catch them in Kenosha Harbor all summer long when water is cool enough and, and that. So it's a really good opportunity to catch some a really cool fish all summer for shore fishermen. Yeah, that, that is going to be really it was cool. never stocked in Illinois, but when I was a kid, late '80s, early '90s, we would see them in uh, the South Rocks. You know, they would when they were perch fishing, I would see them hanging around the rocks, and I would just catch one on a night crawler. So it's a good thing for kids too. You know, they're going to catch trout when the weather is nice. Yeah, no, that that's really cool because then they'll be around in the summer when the water's a little bit warmer. They're more to- tolerant of that. Yeah, right. as yeah. long as we got yeah we got that west wind to cool it down, they'll. Hopefully they'll be around. I haven't seen one yet, but I know I've seen pictures. I know Andrew just sent me one, and he caught it as one of those fuzzy flies that he ties. It looked like I don't know his beard, <laughs> but you did catch one, and yeah, it was a pretty cool rookie. So it's good to see that people are are catching them. A lot, a lot of a lot of cool options out there to uh, to get into fish for sure. Yeah, um, Jared, let everybody know if they want to get you on a trip where they can reach out to you at. Um, I got my cards here at Lake Michigan Angler, or you can uh, hit me up on Facebook um, or give me a call, 847-602-1632. Great and, opportunity uh, to fish with you. Also, I, I think it's worth mentioning, too, that uh, guys can also, you know, book you to uh, learn about small boat fishing. Small, small boat fishing. I know you'll, you've done that as well, right, taking guys out where you, you'll fish, but, like, you're also instructing them so they can apply it. Also. Yeah, uh, definitely, especially after uh, we made that one video. I've had a, quite a few people reach out to me for uh, uh, more, like, instructional. Like coaching, basically. Coaching, right? yes. You walk them through how you're doing on the boat. And right. So, yeah, and then, yeah, if you're out with me, ask a lot of questions. You know, I had guys last year that at the end of the trip just revealed, like, that's what they were there for to try to learn. I'm like, you could have asked me a bazillion questions. Yeah. Which is fine because then I, you know, I met them with their boat and then explained to them on how to set up their boat, you know, and, and got them underway. Yeah, uh, like I said, it's it's a big lake, lots of fish here. There's not much secrets that we keep, so we try to get everyone to have a successful day in the water. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's always good to have you here, uh, and 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 sharing your insight and experience through the uh, the pink salmon uh, explosion here on Lake Michigan. Uh, always good to have you here. Make sure again check out the video for small boats that we did with Captain Jerry. It's really really good. We'll link in it to uh, links down in the description below. Uh, stop on by the shop, call in, visit the website, lakemichiganangler.com for any gear you need, especially over the winter period. Stock up because before you know it, ice is going to be melting again. We're going to get ready to be back on the water, and you're going to need to kind of re-up all your all your gear. And it, that's usually when it goes out here really fast. Everyone starts yep. right about now and all the way through, what, like April, May, and mm-hmm. starts picking up and, and all that stuff. So reach out to us. Um, uh, any other final words you got, Rob? No, I think uh... – I'm looking forward to next year. I think I say that in every podcast. And, uh, yes. <laughs> so thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Later, y'all. Till the next one.